All right, so has, uh, has anyone here heard of GitHub? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, it's a thing. Um, but no, I want to I, I be clear that I'm like, I'm not here to pitch you, I'm not here to try to sell GitHub or, or GitHub projects. Um, I'm really here to kind of uh, give like an exclusive insight into kind of what I see in the company every day working there. I've been there for about three years, so I've seen the company grow a lot. Um, and I think it's just kind of keeping in the theme of the conference as far as technological changes and social changes, things like open source and all the electronic communications we have. I think GitHub is a really kind of great example of a company that's embraced a lot of this stuff and taken advantage of it. And so I'd like to uh, uh, tell you guys a little bit about how we're doing that. Um, but first, just a uh, little bit of background on GitHub. We're coming up on a five-year birthday here, October 17th. Uh, so the first commit was five years ago. Um, GitHub is, was self-funded until recently this year we took our first round. Uh, GitHub's been profitable since about uh, a year after um, being in business. Uh, and um, we took VC only after we had um, 100 employees and we're doing uh, quite well. Um, and so today at GitHub, there are 122 uh, hubbers, employees, uh, people that make the company work. Um, and 82 of those people were added in the past year. So the company has tripled um, since this time uh, last year. And uh, if you look at a lot of our metrics, whether it be uh, like request throughput or uh, new users or a lot of the financial numbers, we're seeing this kind of growth in a lot of areas in the business. And so it's, it's really excited and it's, things are changing really quickly and, and, and things are pretty uh, crazy. Um, and just to kind of give a feel of how the company breaks down as far as personnel, different people that do different things. Um, there's the four founders, all of which have a pretty deep technical background, lots of uh, um, uh, open source experience. They're all, they've all run open source projects, done, done things like that. They're all basically uh, really solid engineers. Uh, there's about 55 developers, 17 designers, 12 support, 10 apps, four sales guys, mostly in uh, the enterprise side of GitHub, um, four people running the office, people doing Git training, Git and GitHub training, uh, two HR, uh, marketing guy, um, we have a, somebody running a shop, we can buy t-shirts and stuff, and then we have somebody doing uh, community type outreach stuff. Um, and I think, I don't know, this, is, this looks pretty normal to me for a software company our size, it's definitely engineering heavy, but I think for a, a company like GitHub, this is about what you'd expect, there's nothing too weird here, um, except I think that there's one kind of big exception, and that's that there's, there's no managers. There's not uh, anybody with a title of manager um, at GitHub. Uh, there's no departmental managers, there's no product managers, no project managers. There's just nobody whose sole job it is is to manage something specific at GitHub. Um, and I think that's really kind of strange. Um, so in a typical organization, um, even getting about our size, you, you start to need to build a hierarchy and, and uh, something that looks kind of like this. You have a CEO and maybe some VPs, uh, uh, directors reporting up to VPs, managers reporting up to directors, um, and uh, a really popular way of splitting up companies is by department. So you have an engineering department and a QA department and all these other kind of things. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this model works really well in a lot of cases. It's kind of been working well for a hundred years, uh, and it's kind of responsible for a lot of the world we seen around us. Um, but GitHub doesn't look like this. There's no rigid hierarchy, there's no uh, reporting structure, there's none, none of the management nodes even exist. Um, and in fact, if you look at the way, if I had to draw the GitHub org chart, it would look a lot more like this, uh, kind of just all out chaos. Um, this is actually an open source community, this is the Perl community on GitHub. This guy, Frank Cooney, um, wrote a piece of software that makes API calls to GitHub and then builds these maps of interactions between individuals based on activity. And it shows how um, different things arise. And while this looks really chaotic and crazy, you, you do see some structure here. It's not that there's no structure at all, right? Like you have kind of hubs and spokes, 
and uh, centers of kind of gravity and things going on, but the structure is much more kind of emergent based on the things that are happening around these projects than it is organized from the top down. Um, um, and so how many people here have contributed to an open source project, have done some kind of work? Wow, okay, awesome, amazing. So you basically know what it's like to work at GitHub. Internally, our processes work very much like that. There's uh, projects, there's people interested in projects, there's people coming up with ideas for projects, they're submitting it to projects, there's people reviewing those changes and either accepting them or, re or rejecting them. And that's pretty much the way the organization works. It's a lot of independent actors um, doing things. And so one of the things that's strange at GitHub is that we don't focus very heavily on very rigid uh, kind of role description. So in the previous slide I showed like developers versus designers and stuff like that, but um, we tend not to look at people so much by their specialty. It isn't like, oh, I need to allocate a developer or allocate a designer. A lot of our designers write code. Um, actually, I think all of our designers write some front end code and build out the uh, front end of the work that they do. And some of them even go pretty deep into the back end as well. Some de developers dabble in um, design. Uh, you're really kind of free to mess around with any kind of technologies or any kind of things that uh, interest you. And so I used to play this game whenever I was a kid. On, it was on a Nintendo game that I thought was just amazing. Does, it, does this look familiar to anybody, baseball stars? Okay, so the, the, the idea of the game is it is a baseball game, but it wasn't really about like playing baseball. It wasn't like hitting the ball and catching and fielding and stuff like that. It was, the, the basic idea was you were, you were actually running a baseball club, right? So you had a certain amount of money and you started really shitty and then you would play people and if you won, then you put more people in the stands and you got more money and you could trade players and invest some of that money into uh, people's abilities. And um, in a lot of ways, I think at GitHub, this is kind of how we tend to think of our team. It's much more about how we can manage like a club and get a lot of different abilities that work well together. Um, and so this is a screen from the game. <laughs> and you can see that <laughs> this is our interface for dealing with employees. No. Um, <laughs> So there's this guy, and there's how much you're paying him, and then there's all these different abilities that he has, and it's like hitting, batting, running, defense, luck, and prestige, whatever. And at GitHub, we really look at, we, we really want people with kind of a range of abilities. We don't just want engineers. We want engineers that know how to manage their own time. We want engineers that know how to write English and communicate uh, the things that they're doing. So. Um, we're not really big on kind of, uh, you know, the, the Barry Bonds type guys that are going to come in and hit home runs but not be able to contribute a lot else to the team. We really like people with a range of skills. Uh, and we invest a lot in making sure people can uh, experiment with different things. And so this is, uh, this is kind of another take on the same thing. This is Kyle Neitz, uh, what he calls the spectrum of builders. Um, and the idea is, is that you know, people typically <coughs> fall on, on, on this uh, spectrum somewhere, but they might be proficient in other kind of abilities. Um, and in a company like GitHub, you have low-level systems guys, and you have, you know, business guys that are looking at numbers all day, and you need all of these different skills in a company, but not necessarily um, every person has to have just one of them, right? Like, you just need to make sure the abilities are there. Uh, you don't have to assign rigid roles to people necessarily. Uh, and this is kind of how Kyle classifies himself. Um, so he's a very good visual designer. I say he's the best interaction designer I've ever uh, worked with. Um, but when GitHub was getting into um, building a Mac client, we didn't have anybody that knew Mac. So he had to go over there. He had done a little bit of Mac design, but he'd never done any development over there. He had to learn Objective-C. He had to do some stuff. He got far enough to where he put together like a really crappy thing. Um, and, and understood Objective-C, but enough that he could like communicate what he wanted to do to the company in a very concrete way. And then when it was time for him to hire a, a Mac developer, he, he could kind of speak on even terms with them because he, they were speaking the same language and he knew what to look for, what not to look for. Uh, he also is decent at Unix, which is kind of amazing for a designer, and he's very good at communicating the things that he's doing to both internally to the company and um, like writing blog posts and just talking about the features that we're um, working on. Uh, and so I think at GitHub, we really encourage this kind of experimentation in other areas. We like people that, that can put up like a triple-double or something like that every once in a while. 
Um, and, and it's something that we invest in and want people to spend time on. And, and that's something that each employee is in control of, but the more abilities you have, the more you understand the whole product development cycle, the more valuable you are to the company because that lets us do a lot more with fewer people. So if you have two or three people that have all the abilities that you need to ship a piece of product, then they can typically get things done a lot more quickly and a lot better than a team of seven people um, coordinated across seven different departmental boundaries. That takes a long time. A lot of those projects just don't work because of just the number of people involved. Um, and just to kind of illustrate this, this is uh, a bunch of recent blog posts. So the GitHub blog, these are feature announcements. Um, and I show this to you not for the specific features that are on there um, or number of features or anything like that, but just the range of names. So each name that you see on here, there's maybe 13 or 14 different names in the last few months. Each one of these people were responsible for coming up with an idea or stealing somebody else's idea, and I'll get into kind of how that happens. But then taking that idea, building something out, getting at least one other, people one other person interested in it. You're not allowed to work alone at GitHub. You have to have at least one other person in the company that's working with you, that's interested in the thing. Basically, if you can't get two people interested in something, then it's probably not interesting at all. Um, so that's kind of one check and balance on, on the do whatever you want model. Um, but each of these people then developed it, they had, to know, they had to do whatever they could with their abilities and then find other people with the abilities that they didn't have and convince them to do that work. So that wasn't me allocating a designer and a developer, that was each individual, if they wanted to ship a feature, they had to assemble each of the um, people's abilities in order to ship that out. And then at the end, um, they had to write a blog post and they had to be able to write down and basically explain the feature, why it's there in a, in a succinct way um, uh, to our customers. Okay, so how many people here have maintained an open source project? Oh, good, that's a, that's a pretty good number. So you basically know what my job is like at GitHub. I, um, I've been there for, for a little while. My name is Ryan Tomeko. You can find me on these fine internet websites. And um, I've, be, I've been at GitHub for uh, about three years now. I'm an employee six or seven, uh, including the founders. I and mean, I was the first developer employee. So just by kind of, uh, as a result of me being there a long time and being involved in a lot of projects early on, I have kind of a maintainership role on a lot of these internal projects. So I review a lot of patches, I get people involved, I try to recruit people to come work on the projects that I think are interesting. I try to push off my maintainership duties on projects to new people whenever I can, um, things like that. My title is director, but I'm not really anyone's boss. I don't get to tell anybody what to do at GitHub. Um, I can try to convince them through argument, but that's about my only power. I don't really have authority over anybody else's time. Um, and I, I think of my job as just making sure that people can contribute when they want to. So if somebody's interested in a project, I, I, I view my job as being a facilitator, somebody that can show them the processes and tools that we use uh, to be able to, to make those kinds of changes. Uh, just a little bit of background on me. I've worked at uh, Fortune 100 companies on 150 man development teams that were extremely hierarchical. Um, I've started my own business and, and failed miserably after about two years. Worked at a number of startups in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, uh, and I've maintained uh, some open source projects. Uh, probably most notably is uh, Sinatra. I maintained that for about a year and a half um, through the one over release. So I've been around, I've seen a lot of different types of organizations and different ways of working, and it's been really interesting to watch GitHub grow the size it is now and, and keep this kind of weird organizational structure, and so uh, that's what I want to get into here. Um, so this is a quote. I've heard this, I've, I've had this conversation like literally about a hundred times. I've probably had this conversation with Peter before, I, I don't know. I, um, it comes up a lot and it used to come up a lot more whenever we were smaller, around like let's say 20 people because we really liked our culture, we really liked our organizational system and we didn't really think we needed to change it. But whenever we would go uh, exhibit at a booth at a conference or we throw a lot of events and, and do a lot of things like that, just about anybody you talk to, uh, the conversation leads very naturally to this because they ask you, what do you do at GitHub? And you, and you have to say, well, I do like everything. I do like every part of the, and they're like, whose boss are you? And I'm nobody's boss. And well, is somebody your boss? No, not really. And, and eventually it gets to this. They're really intrigued by it and are really interested, but are just very confident that it's just, uh, it's just a startup and that's just how startups work and things like that. And for a long time, we weren't really sure 
um, if, if the model was going to work out well as we grew and stuff like this. But um, yeah, I think, the, I think the assumption tends to be like one of two different things. Uh, the first is that we're kind of just a bunch of anarchists, like cowboy coders. Um, this is the cowboy in chief. Um, that, we, that we just hate structure and organization because we're like developer, like neckbeard types that just, it's a, it, we don't like it, you know, like it makes us uncomfortable or something. Um, and then I think the other kind of assumption is that we're like hippie, uh, you know, idealists that if we just get our like vibe right and have our energy in the right areas that the software will just magically um, produce itself. But I think in either case it's, it's kind of an assumption that we're just naive about business and we just don't, we just don't understand. There's no way that we can get away with organizing the company like this um, without management and without structure. Um, but the truth is actually, I think, really a lot more simple. Um, and, and to explain it in the form of a Venn diagram, there's problems that we've run into in GitHub that, uh, and there's been a lot of them. There's things that we're not good at. Um, and then there were problems that we felt were best solved by managers. Um, and so I want to be clear here. I'm not saying that like we don't have any problems that managers solve. I'm just saying that I think there's a lot of built-in things with GitHub, like being from open source and that being our DNA and not so much a traditional business model, that a lot of the issues we've run into are not around coordinating people or building in cooperation or carrying information around the company. Um, we just haven't had a lot of issues with that. So it's not that we're actively keeping management out or keeping these things out. We've just never hired one of those people. We just never felt like that person was going to come in and add something that we uh, really <coughs> needed. Uh, and part of that is just from being engineers, I think, and, and we kind of borrow a lot of our engineering methodology for building the organization. So, you know, we don't want to add process. We don't want to over-engineer. We don't want to solve problems before we have them um, because that results in really junky software and I think it results in really junky organizations as well. Um, so yeah, I learned to avoid this conversation. I, like people would ask me what I do, and I just say I'm a developer, or you know, just uh, basically go smoke a cigarette or something, and uh, just kind of avoid it. And um, I don't know. I think it was kind of a, a bad place to be because I really liked our internal culture, but I didn't feel like I could talk to anybody outside of the company about it and 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 be very convincing in my arguments. Uh, and then there were two things that happened um, that have made me a little bit more confident in, in wanting to talk about this more. And the first thing is just that, that, that GitHub has grown tremendously. Uh, so we're 122 people now. It's, it's kind of hard to say. It was You could say when we were 30 people, like wait until you're 60, then you'll have to add structure. When you're 60 people, wait until you're 100, you'll have to add structure. Now it's getting to the point where it's like, well, if we needed to add a lot of this, we probably would have done it by now. And I'm involved in a lot of the um, you know leadership conversations in, in uh, things that go on with, with the future, you know, how are we planning the organization, and this is something that still isn't really coming up as being a solution to some of the problems that we have right now. Um, so that's one thing, just GitHub growing and, and still maintaining this kind of weird culture. Um, but the other big thing is, uh, earlier this year in April, the Valve handbook was, uh, was leaked. And uh, it's, this is a handbook for new employees, they give it out to anybody whenever they start at Valve. Um, and just some background on Valve, it made Half-Life and Counter-Strike and Portal. I'm sure everybody's here knows about um, Valve. They make Steam, the online retail game store where they sell all their games and you can download them right from there. Or, and also other publishers' games, it's like thousands of games available on there, it's doing really well. Uh, they have 300 employees and have been in business for 16 years now. Um, and they have 2.5 billion estimated total equity, according to Wikipedia. Um, and maybe most importantly to me is that they just have a, a track record for making like really high quality shit that people like and then distributing it widely and making money. And as somebody that's on the product side of the company at GitHub, I, that's where I'm looking for an edge. That's what I'm really interested in those things. I'm really interested in any company that's building high quality software, high quality products today because that's what I want GitHub to do. I think that's really what will set us apart from other companies. Um, but you get into this handbook and it's just absolutely crazy. Their structure resembles a, a lot like GitHub. It's very flat. This is their organizational chart. Um, and so you can see, I don't even know, this first couple diagrams, it's, just, it's basically just flat. And then there's some weird star thing. And then you see something that looks a lot like the open source map in diagram four. 
Um, and this is just how their company works. And they were able to distill all kinds of ideas about this way of working at a company. And they're, they're obviously a, a big, legitimate company that's still operating like this at 300, I think, going on 400 employees now. And so this was just, this was just a massive, big deal at GitHub whenever it came out. Because I think even internally, we were struggling to communicate a lot of the things that we believed about how the company should be organized to even employees. And then Valve kind of just laid this handbook in our laps, and it was almost to a T exactly how we work. Um, and it was just it was just absolutely marvelous. And it's a big reason why I'm here today talking about this at all. Um, it, it's just given me a framework to, to think about this, and, and it, 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 if it's easier for me to talk about and experiment with these things now, I think maybe by talking about it, it would be easier for other people. And so that's really what I'm uh, trying to accomplish. Um, but yeah, look at the Valve Handbook. There's some just amazing, hilarious stuff in there. This is like, this is my favorite part. There's where they define their processes and stuff, and this is the method for finding out what's going on. And it's like, <laughs> talk to somebody, basically. It's like, go up to somebody and talk to them. Um, so yeah, definitely check that out. Um, so now I want to I wanna just talk about a little bit about like, the role of management, what management does in a company, and kind of how a lot of those same things happen at GitHub without people that are specifically managers. Um, and I'm not going to go over all these. I think pretty much everybody here is, is aware of the functions that management serves. But just try to keep these in mind and think about how these might be satisfied by some of the processes and tools that we have um, at GitHub. Um, and so remember earlier I said that at GitHub there are no managers. And really that's kind of a lie. Uh, there's, there's actually 122 managers. Um, and so the, w the way that it, that works is we kind of look at management as just another one of these abilities on a scale. So we have a lot of people at GitHub that did, have done management in a previous life, either product management or project management or manage an engineering team or whatever. Uh, so they have those skills. They know whenever a project needs some help and they can go and help on those things and anyone's kind of allowed to wear those hat. And so for us, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of hiring a lot. You know, like when you're looking at people to hire, you want to bring people in that have those skills because it's still beneficial. Um, and the, the no management thing can almost be a little bit of a scam because when we're recruiting people, we're like, yeah, it's great. There's no management, there's no management, there's no management. And then you come in and you see that there's no management, but what you find out is that that's because it's, it's, it's another responsibility and another thing that you have to deal with. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a rip off, but uh, it, it seems to be working. Um, and so I was thinking about a lot about why this is, like why, how is it that we can not have people that are specifically managers? And I think a lot of it has to do with just what we got from open source. Like our, the way we work together is very much um, a, a, just a copy of how open source works. And so I was thinking about this and pretty much open, every open source project follows like a set of constraints. Um, and it's not really by design, it's just because it has to. In order to survive, an open source project really has to have a few things that it does well. Um, and I think those things are, are these four things. Uh, Communication and process should be electronic, so not a lot of reliance on meet space. So as far as like two people getting in a room or stand at meetings or, or any of these things that require two people to be in the same place at the same time, uh, you can't really rely on that in open source. And the reason is obvious, you have a guy in LA and a guy in Madagascar that are working together. How do they communicate? They have to communicate electronically. Um, I think also that all um, process and communication in open source projects is available and accessible uh, and basically they all have URLs so any discussion you have, any serious discussion that you have about um, building the project or proposing a change, it's all captured in a way that you can link to later. And This is really important because the people that are working on a project today are not necessarily the people that will be working on it three months or a year from now and so when people come into the project it's very nice to have uh, an archive of everything that's happened. Um, so like open source projects simply have mailing lists or use issue trackers of some kind and that's extremely valuable. Or maybe people find the project because that information is available. You're doing a Google query and you stumble on this project and now you want to contribute to it because you think it seems interesting. Um, asynchronous, you can almost never um, interrupt somebody in an open source project. You can kind of stick something in somebody's queue. So you can send an email and it goes to them, but you can't really like call them and interrupt them on the phone or walk over to their desk and interrupt their flow or whatever it is they're working on. 
uh, you kind of, it's, it's like a, a series of queues, which each person is uh, working off their queue and generating messages to other queues. Um, and it's lock free. And this is, this is one that I, I, I'm, I've, I kind of struggled with on, on a list to define. I think the, the best example of this is, is Git itself and distributed version control, like removing the commitment and making it to where people can act independently without having to synchronize on a single resource, like a manager. This bit, lock free basically means no managers, no uh, manager that um, developers have to synchronize on in order to complete some work. You can do the work and then it can be reviewed at a later time uh, and discussed from there. Um, and so I think this is a lot of how our internal processes and communications work just because we're um, very familiar with open source. We like that model of working whenever I started we didn't have an office We didn't have an office for a year and a half or something like that after I started so three three and a half years into github um, GitHub's history uh, we worked out of coffee shops And so we needed a lot of flexibility in, in communication and stuff like that um, And so I want to go through some of our internal tools and some of our processes and, and kind of see if you can see these four things in them and, and maybe compare them to what would be the analog in a, in a traditional business. Uh, so we rely very <coughs> heavily on a bunch of internal tools. We spend a lot of time building internal tools for ourselves to communicate with each other and, and to um, just manage the information flow. And one of those tools uh, is called uh, Team. We just call it it's team.github.app.com. It's an internal thing. Um, it's kind of like, it looks a lot like Twitter, the basics of it are like Twitter, it's status updates. So you're just posting information on the project that you're working on or, or uh, your general area of business, giving some insight into what it is that you're doing. Um, and so, for instance, here people are uh, posting a picture from a training session. That's really great for me, I have no visibility into what training is doing and, and something like this gives me that visibility and lets me know whenever something's going on. I can see when people start in on a project, if somebody starts in on a project that I know is going on somewhere else, I can catch that fairly quickly. So the whole duplication of work, because everybody's kind of constantly posting status updates, you catch a lot of things early on. Um, another aspect of this is we, have, we store ideas in teams. So pretty much all innovation, all ideas that um, you come up with for the product or the office or any aspect of GitHub, um, you post them here, everybody sees them, you can comment on them, and then you really get a feel for how much support there is in the company for any given idea. So these are very kind of broad ideas, things like that, not specific to a product or, or anything really. It's the center of innovation at GitHub. So instead of those things kind of coming down from management or like a leadership team, we really rely on everybody in the company to be po constantly posting ideas. We only use maybe two to five percent of them, but just having this uh, available for people is uh, is very nice and, and, and makes people feel like empowered that they you know can have an impact on every part of the business. If an idea is good, it'll get picked up and it'll get worked on. Um, another aspect of this is that we have uh, iOS versions of, of this app, so you, you, you can get all the same content on the phone or on iPad and it just looks absolutely beautiful. Um, we like to say that this is made for buses and bathrooms, so the idea is, is just to let you manage information flow and kind of your idle time um, in a tool that you want to use. We want to make it gorgeous, we spend a lot of time on this. The, a lot of the guys that work on iOS stuff at GitHub work on this. Uh, this is really something that um, any engineer in the company, any designer in the company can come contribute to these tools. It's not like a, a team that's responsible for, for doing these things. And so you get a lot of interesting stuff like this. We also have Android versions because there's Android developers in the company and they spend time um, uh, making the uh, team stuff something that they can run on their devices. So this is a view of, yeah, this is what the ideas look like whenever um, you post something in here and you're looking at it on the iPad. So it's, it looks really good. It looks just amazing on the uh, red screens. I post ideas just so I can see like the text on the on the iPad <laughs> screen, um, and so they get you. You know, they get you with this this amazing tech. Um, and then also as part of the team app is we have our kind of handbook, and this goes into all kinds of aspects of GitHub. It's kind of where people start whenever they come on, and it's the beginning of the onboarding process. It talks a lot about. Um, and there's paperwork and, and crap like that that you have to do, but also like philosophies on the company. So this one's actually about management, and it's, it's laying out very plainly a lot of the things that I'm talking about here. 
um, and how we look at management, how we look at projects, how we look at what are your responsibilities for managing your time, what you're expected to do, who you're expected to do it with, things like that. Um, so that's really great. All this stuff is here. It's in an iPad. You can read it in bed. Yes. Are you going to be as nice as Val and leak? <laughs> I would love to. I would love to. I would love to leak the handbook. I, I wasn't involved in the making of the handbook. Um, so I'd have, we'd have to talk to those guys, but I would, I would love to put our handbook out there. It's, it's beautiful. It's one of the best things I've read. I can just leak it right now, I guess. Which manager do you need to check with first? Yeah, right. right. <laughs> manager. Um, so, really quickly. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about just offices, um, because I think if there's one thing from kind of traditional business or, or from the last century of business that's really kind of sticking around and that people don't want to let go of is it's the idea of the office and the office being the center of all process and communication. Um, but the off like an office, it's, it's human and it's, it's like almost like an office means business. It's so tied to business ideas, but it's one of the biggest causes of violations <laughs> of all of those communication constraints that we talked about. Like, um, it's not electronic, You're, everything is in person, nothing is available in archive, so if you have design reviews or development reviews in a room with two other guys, there's no chance that anybody else can participate in that. Um, it's not a synchronous, there's people walking up to other people and, and interrupting them, knocking them out of their flow, demanding their time and attention. Um, and it's not like free. Everything that you do is kind of organized around meeting at certain places at certain times. You have things like core hours and stand-up meetings and all that stuff. Um, and so at GitHub, we've, we've not relied on the office. Like I said, we didn't have an office until uh, very uh, three years into GitHub's history or something like that. And so we learned to rely on uh, uh, essentially chat really heavily to do a lot of the things that you would do in the office. And we just use 37 signals campfire, um, which is really great on its own because it has an uh, important feature in archiving. So you have transcripts. Anything that happens in the chat rooms is recorded forever. They have URLs, so it's available. You can go back to it at another time. Um, so it's really great on its own. But then we've done a lot to enhance it as well. We have our own campfire client. Uh, that's kind of amazing. And then we have uh, Hubot is a chatbot that we've used to essentially automate all kinds of areas of our process. Um, and just to kind of <clears throat> give a feel for what you would see in a GitHub chat room, you have a number of rooms at the bottom. I guess you can't see that very well. But this is the .com room. This is where most activity around building GitHub.com happens, the, the main GitHub.com product. Um, here we have John Rohan deploying something to production, and you get a bunch of information about the, the specific change, the range of SHA ones, and the uh, output of the deploy command. Then he's linking me to a discussion um, somewhere else. You can see that's green, so I get pinged. Uh, we also have this, a feature of team. I get a notification on my phone anytime somebody mentions me in Campfire as well. So I know immediately anytime I'm needed or, or something is going on that requires my attention, I can go back and look at that at some other time. And then Jesse Newland is bringing up a graph looking at kind of the current uh, response time values or something um, to know whether or not right now is a good time to move forward with this change or not. But almost everything at GitHub, all of, all of this process happens publicly in chat, you can go in any chat room and you can see how the business is operating electronically. If you're somebody new, you can essentially just come in and lurk and, and watch what's going on for a couple of weeks. Um, and so I think this is, there's something like really powerful about this. This is what removes the locks. A lot of companies have a release manager or a deploy manager or things like that. that that's uh, an area where you're not being locked free. Anytime you have to synchronize to, in order to deploy, you have to have one single person that you synchronize on. Uh, that just means that people aren't going to be able to move as quickly as they could otherwise if that process was automated and visible. Um, so here, I love this as just an example. This is Simon is asking about some command um, in Campfire, and Jesse answers with the command at which time Simon sees the output. So it's almost like Chat to us is almost like a shared operations environment. We can operate all of production and, and a lot of our other processes just by interacting in chat and, and using Qbot to do things. Uh, I think this is really powerful. I like to call it learning by lurking. Um, just about every major aspect of process at GitHub is automated in this way. So if it's updating the status site or seeing basic uh, information on, on 
response time values, every graph across the company that we have, you can pull up in Qbot. And you don't only see the result of it, you see the actual command that led to the thing. So people are able to learn all kinds of new things just by essentially sitting in a chat room um, and you get animated GIFs and stuff too, it's pretty great. Um, and so, I don't know, I think that's, that's really powerful and it, and it follows all of the constraints of, of communications that we talked about. That's what we try to do, we try to build that into all of our tools. Um, another example, we have a stand-up meeting, or a, I'm sorry, an all-hands meeting on every Friday, we call it Beer 30. Um, it's kind of like at the end of the day, whoever's in the office goes over to the uh, presentation area, grabs a beer, and you listen to the CEO or somebody talk about some aspect of GitHub. And you can see this is just, some of it is like philosophy of the company, some of it is like important information like VC stuff, um, different, all, all kinds of different things. But even this was very early on uh, recorded and published so it's streamed. To, uh, so that you don't have to be in the office. We don't, it's basically never, there's no such thing as a mandatory meeting in, uh, at GitHub. Uh, anything that you do has to be made available to everybody in a way that's asynchronous that other people can get to it. And this is really powerful. It means that, um, you know, we can have people in Australia that are just as in tune with what's going on in the company as the people that sat there and watched it, or most of it. Um, so we try to uh, build these things into kind of every part of GitHub's process. It's not even to mention GitHub itself, which is very much built on the same kind of basic constraints. Uh, that's, I guess that's where all of this stuff came from originally for us. The product kind of worked like that, and we just strove to make all of our processing communication work like that. So rules for good processing communications, uh, be electronic, make things available, everything should have a URL. Um, be asynchronous, don't interrupt people, let them work on their own time. Have a bunch of look at everybody as cues that are that are able to work at their on their own and be lock free. Don't require people to synchronize on a single resource in order to get work done. Try to automate things um, to make sure that people can act independently or with as as little friction as possible. Um, and so, so far I've kind of been trying to present this as is kind of like defending some of these processes and tools in. in the way we do things against a traditional organization and structure and showing that you get some of the same things in, in both places. But um, now I want to switch and, and talk about the things that I think uh, this model is actually better at. So like a, like a competitive advantage or, or things that, I, that um, this type of uh, situation uh, is better than traditional business at. And one of them is remote workers. For a really long time, um, we didn't want anyone remote, so everybody that worked at GitHub lived in San Francisco. There were maybe, I want to say, 17 or 18 of us before we took on our first remote employee. We just thought that we were all really close. We'd go out after work or we'd meet a lot in the city, and we, we felt that those um, kind of like, those personal relationships were really important, and we just weren't ready to take on remote employees. But when we thought about it, we were like, wow, if anybody's in the position to take on remote employees, it's probably us, because the office is more for parties than it is for meetings. You don't really have to be here. Like the entire company is is built in this way that you don't you don't have to be present. It's it's almost made for a remote workforce. So in a lot of companies, whenever you want to start hiring um, remote employees, it's a big shift for a company. You have to start doing things different. It's, you have to uproot all kinds of stuff. And then even whenever you do bring on remote employees, a lot of times they're kind of second class citizens, right? They're not, they miss a ton that happens at the office. They miss a lot of meetings. They, they get just dumped kind of shit work to keep them busy because they can't be engaged in what's going on. It's very hard to change a culture in that way. And so at GitHub, it's very distributed. There's um, people all over the US, um, people in Europe, um, and you can see down here at the bottom left, there's a bunch of people right now that are in Hawaii. This is part of team, by the way. There's like a geo location thing. It's pretty awesome. Um, there's a bunch of people in Hawaii right now, and that's just part of an initiative at GitHub that we're calling GitHub Destinations. Basically, GitHub rents a house somewhere in the world. We've done it in Berlin and now Kona, Hawaii. And uh, we'll pay for a person and a significant other to fly there and just work from Kona for three weeks because why not? There's no downside to you being somewhere else. And why wouldn't you want to go to Kona and, and you know, scuba dive or something whenever uh, you have a spare second? So I think that's really powerful and I think it's um, really beneficial to people um, and, and just a hugely nice perk. Are you hiring? <laughs> In Kona? <laughs> Uh, we, we have been hiring, yes, a little bit. <laughs> um, 
Another, I think, tremendous benefit here, and we didn't see any of this kind of stuff coming. This is stuff that we're discovering uh, works really well if you structure a company like that is, is family. So I'm married, I have a wife and two kids, and it's, I, don't, I don't know how I did it before I had this kind of flexibility. Because it's like every single day a kid is sick, or there's a play, or there's something going on. And when that happens, I don't have to like send an email and say I'll be out of office from 11 to 3. I mean, it's basically expected that I'm not going to be at the office at any um, given time. So you don't have those kind of things. You're flexible to go and, and do all kinds of stuff. Um, and that can be a real advantage, especially in the area of things like hiring. So this is, this is Phil Atkins. Uh, he's kind of a huge guy in, in the Windows open source community. He's the, he's the most followed person on Twitter at uh, GitHub. Uh, and he started at GitHub about seven or eight months ago, and prior to that, he was a fairly high-ranking middle manager at, at Microsoft, and um, seemed to kind of have it all. Um, but he came to GitHub, and I think it, in large part because he really liked the culture, and he really liked some of these freedoms, and his experience with open source told him that you, you can work like this if people are responsible, and he has like 15 kids or something like that, so he saw the benefit of it there. And so, just from a recruiting perspective, you get a lot of benefits. You know, people people want to work at, at GitHub for a lot of these reasons. Um, this is another guy, Mark Embriaco. Um, he just started at GitHub uh, maybe a week and a half ago. He's kind of a legendary ops guy, and yeah, he's 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 amazing. I, I'll give it up. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, he, he, again, he was in a management position uh, prior to GitHub and would seem to be in a really good spot. And he came to GitHub and now he's just a, an ops guy. He's going to use his management abilities and all that. But I think he really liked the model and he really liked what we as a company had to offer as far as process and things like that. And so we're attracting a lot of talent and I think it has to do with the way the company <coughs> is organized. But if, you know, maybe you've never heard of either of those guys, there's always the entire open source community um, that you can recruit from because obviously people in the open source community know how to work in this kind of environment. They're going to be motivated, which is kind of a necessity. So personally, I think this is a, a huge untapped pool of potential employees in that a lot of companies are, are using open source to find people that they like, but they're really not offering them this the kind of work environment where they excel. And so I think if you do, you have a, a huge advantage of the, over companies that don't work this way um, because people that are, are really into open source and that way of developing are going to appreciate that kind of company, I think, a lot more. Um, so just to wrap up, um, I don't know, what am I doing? I'm not like trying to convince everybody here to like radically change their company tomorrow or anything. Um, but I think that it, it's, there's some like concrete stuff here that you could, you could try and I think you'd find it very beneficial, you know, like evaluate some of your internal processes, see if they break any of these core constraints and if they do, maybe just try to make a tweak and, and see if, if you can get them to follow this. Uh, if not, no big deal, but if they do, see if you notice like uh, that process working better, especially for people in different areas and see what new freedoms it gives you. Uh, and I think it could be really powerful. So that's it. Thank you very much.